Hello, everyone, and welcome to our event. I'm Farah, and this is Martin Perlmutter. We're co-founders of Speaker Spotlight, and thank you so much for joining us. Two weeks ago, like most of you, we first saw the video footage of George Floyd murdered by a police officer in broad daylight on the street in Minneapolis. For the next few days, we read, as we read more about what took place, and we watched the news coming out from the US, we had a really difficult time thinking about anything else. And we went through a range of emotions, including disbelief, heartbreak, anger, and maybe some of you can relate, we really felt a sense of helplessness. Then we read Masai Jerry's op-ed in the Globe and Mail, uh, in which he wrote, so many of you are asking, what can I do? There's a sense of helplessness, but that must not paralyze us. Your voice matters, especially when you are a leader or influential figure, and especially if you are white. Leaders have to be bold enough to state the obvious and call out racism. So it got us thinking, we have a platform where we can reach a wide number of influential people across the country. What if we create a virtual event where we feature a few of our speakers who have powerful voices, experiences, and opinions on issues related to race, equality, and justice? We're obviously not gonna solve all of society's problems in an hour, but we think it's important that these issues are discussed in a meaningful way to shed some light on the challenges, possible solutions, and what individuals and organizations can do to contribute to making our society better for everyone. So we reached out to a few of our speakers to see if they thought this was a good idea, and if so, if they'd be willing to participate. They all gave us their support, and we're honored that they're here today to share their experiences, insights, and opinions with us. Michael Clemens is a CFL legend who is currently the general manager of the Toronto Argonauts. He's also the founder of the Pinball Clemens Foundation, whose vision is to empower youth through education by bringing them from the margins to the mainstream. He's helped build over 200 schools in seven developing countries. In recognition of his work, Mike has received many awards, including the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal, and he's a member of the Order of Ontario. Tanya Talaga is an award-winning journalist and author who became the first Ojibwe woman to deliver the CBC Massey Lecture, a renowned lecture series that travels to cities across Canada. For the past 20 years, she's worked as a journalist and she's the author of two best-selling books, All Our Relations and Seven Fallen Figures, Seven Fallen Feathers. I knew I was gonna make a mistake at some point here. <laughs> um, which was named CBC's Nonfiction Book of the Year and a Globe and Mail Top 100 book. <laughs> Jamil Giovanni is the Managing Director of Road Home Research and Analysis. Jamil previously taught at Osgoode Hall Law School, graduated from Yale Law School, and served as Vice Chair of the Children's Aid Society of Toronto. Jamil was awarded the 2018 One to Watch Alumni Award by York University and 2017 Youth Leadership Award by the International Development and Relief Foundation. His first book, Why Young Men, was published in Canada by HarperCollins in 2018 and in the United States in 2019. Dr. Hadia Rodrigue is a lawyer, researcher, broadcast commentator, and an award-winning writer. She is most well known for her Globe and Mail piece, Black on Bay Street, which outlined her experiences as a young Black woman working at a Bay Street law firm. Hadia recently completed her PhD in organizational behavior at the Rotman School of Management, and also has an MA in criminology and a JD from the University of Toronto. Orlando Bowen is a former CFL football player whose career was cut short as a result of an unprovoked attack by two corrupt police officers. He's the founder and executive director of One Voice, One Team Youth Leadership Organization. Orlando has been recognized for his work by being selected as one of the Diverse City Fellows, being awarded an African Canadian Achievement Award, Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal, and a National Harry Jerome Award for Community Service. And last but certainly not least, it's my honor to introduce our host for today's event, Marcy Ian. For more than 15 years, Canadians from coast to coast woke up every morning to Marcy Ian's friendly, familiar face as the co-host and news anchor of the national morning program, Canada AM. Today, Marcy is the co-host of one of television's most popular daytime programs, The Social. Marcy's impressive career in television spans over three decades. She was nominated for a Canadian Screen Award for her work on Canada AM, received an African Canadian Achievement Award, and was also honored by, in 2018 by Women's Executive Network with the BMO Arts, Sports, and Entertainment Award. Please welcome Michael, Tanya, Jamil, Hadia, Orlando, and Marcy. Thank you so much, Martin and Farah, for giving us this platform. It's an honor to be here today. 
Um, you said uh, far at the very beginning, all the emotions that you felt uh, when George Floyd was killed and we all saw that video. And so I wanna start by asking um, all of my friends today how they are doing because I have felt so heavy uh, and heartbroken over the last couple of weeks. Before George Floyd, it was Ahmaud Arbery who was just going for a jog in his neighborhood. So, uh, Mike, I wanna start with you, just, just how you're doing and how you're coping, because it hasn't been easy. We have jobs to do, but we carry these thoughts with us. Well, I'm part of the problem, Marcy, um, because um, you know the reality is before this, um, I forgot what it felt like to be to be honest with you. Um, I, I uh, <clears throat> living here and um, in the fashion we do with some name recognition and and celebrity and focus. Um, I, I I can honestly say that I'm I'm part of the problem because um, I wasn't fighting. I, I had forgotten what it felt like and. Um, I, I decided at, at, at some age that uh, I wasn't going to let this take me off track. Uh, when I was in grade six or seven, I wrote a book, uh, I wrote a poem uh, um, that said, stand up, boy, you don't sit there. You know you stand up, not sit in a chair. Hey, Blackie, I got some water. Do you want some? Or oh, I forgot, they don't drink water where you come from. Downrated, segregated, discriminated. By others, we're hated because of our skin, not what's within. And I wrote that because it hurt. And um, somewhere along the way, um, uh, I no longer felt that, um, you know, you, you um, had a, a place in society, if you will. And, and, and yes, we have a foundation that's focused on this and doing this, this work, um, certainly, right? But, but I, I hadn't felt the weight of racism like that since I was a kid and, and, and uh, so I, I have to say that that um, I, I am I'm going to stand up and say that I'm part of the problem, right? But but um, as um, as I used to uh, tell tell the young guys who were on the team, right? I would take I would say, hey, listen, that time was my fault, but I won't be the problem every time, right? So so at some point, right? You know, you have to do your work, right? I'll take that. So 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 I, I am definitely understanding that that I'm shouldering uh, this. Um, I need to shoulder this challenge uh, because I, in many ways, have forgotten that sense of powerlessness and hopelessness. And um, George made the greatest sacrifice, uh, obviously. But, but when you see people who they just have no clue, like, like, what is it going to take? Like, and, and so, um, for me, I'm, 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 I'm challenged and resolute. Yeah, and, and thank you for being so honest, right? And, and that's why we respect you so much because um, of everything that you just said. Um, Dr. Hadia Rodrigue, so happy to be calling you doctor. Uh, I, want you, I want you to weigh in on this, how you're doing, how you're feeling, what you're thinking. Well, I mean, this is not new. This is not new for black people. I, Every day, I'm afraid that someone will pull my dad over and be reckless with their gun. Like that fear has always been with me. Um, I have black sisters, black mother, a black father, black cousins, black uncles. I don't get to stop being black. I'm just, now it's more visible and other people are more familiar with uh, what black people go through on a daily basis. Um, I've also learned who my true friends are, who really is doing the work and you know who's posting a performative black square after saying nothing for two weeks um so that's sort of helpful uh, but i'm also hopeful i think that i've seen a lot of radical discussions um things that we wouldn't have even thought possible you know the minneapolis police for example um, the city council voting to get rid of the police in minneapolis um, and so I'm hopeful that this is really a galvanizing moment, but you know, I ebb and flow between periods where I'm crying for an hour or worrying whether or not I should have children because I'm afraid to bring a black child and a black body into this world. And then other moments where I see sort of hope and, and a possibility of change, but 
it's a real roller coaster is what I, I would say. Mm. Jamil Giovanni, how are you? Um, I, a lot of a lot of emotions I could I could go with right now. I'm, I'll go with to maybe describing the pressure that I feel, and I think a lot of folks um, might relate to this. Where you know when the world starts paying attention to these issues, and but these are things you've been working on, you know, for your whole career, you feel a pressure to try to like take advantage of the window of opportunity to maybe get some action done. Um, you know, and in, in the work I do with the government or the work I do, um, you know, at Pinball's Foundation or the work I do in various advocacy roles, like I have this, this pressure right now to feel like, oh man, well, everyone wants to hear us talk about this now. So this is the time. And it's, a, it's hard to figure out, well, how do you get a million things done in such a short period of time? So it becomes this like, uh, it feels burdensome. And it makes me worry, okay, well, how long are people gonna pay attention? Like when do the, the news cameras turn to something else? And when, do, when does public sentiment kind of gravitate to whatever the next news cycle is? And, and then did, will we look back and say, did we get enough done while people were paying attention, right? And, and you certainly, I think no one wants to feel that way, that we, we missed an opportunity to get some good work done. So, so that's been weighing on me. I've barely been able to sleep for the last couple of weeks. I'm trying my best every day to get as much done as I can. And um, you know, also make sure that good decisions are being made because this is also a time where people can be reactionary. And we've seen um, you know, communities live with long-term consequences when reactionary decisions are made during times like this. So, so yeah, I would say the pressure on my shoulders is probably the thing that, that I'm wrestling with the most right now. Mm -hmm. Tanya Talega, how are you? Uh, it's been a hard time. You know, I, I share many of the sentiments with everyone else on this panel, that feeling of no, not again. You know, that was my first reaction when I saw what happened to George and heard what happened to George. And, you know, I couldn't really watch the video. Um, it was so hard to see because how many of these have we seen? How many times have I seen this? Not just with Black Americans, Black Canadians, Indigenous people, our people. This is something that we see all the time. This is something that we have been living for a long period of time. You know, I thought it was, um, it's really interesting too that this all happened in Minneapolis. It's where this, this latest look inward happened. Minneapolis is the birthplace of the American Indian movement. It's a place where many of our people have been and have fought for our rights. And sadly, we share many of the same issues, you know? This was a continent formed out of violence. It was formed out of the extermination of indigenous people at contact. You can just look at the policies in the United States when it came to the extermination of American Indians to move settlers in, the giving away of land that was occupied, the taking away of children, putting them in Indian residential schools, the loss of our language, the loss of our kids, and our kids die today. We are still facing all of those things, you know. We are still shot and killed along with Black Americans, Black Canadians at high, high rates by authorities, by police. How do we make this better? Systemic racism, we've seen that in all police forces time and time again. What will it take to change things? How long? Will it take? I think often about the words of actually Dr. Martin Luther King when he gave a speech in Stanford in 1967. This was three years after the civil rights legislation was passed in the United States in 64. And he talked about you know, two different Americas. And he talked about too, you can pass as much legislation as you want. You can pass civil rights legislation. You can pass UNDRIP legislation here in Canada. You can pass that in BC. But unless the majority of the people, there's a political will for people to change, we will not achieve equity anywhere. And that's what we need. I hope that we're going to be getting there soon. Yeah, so well said. Orlando, how are you doing? My heart is heavy, you know, um, but I'm, I'm very optimistic. 
I, I think back, I didn't, when I first saw the video, I didn't know the outcome. So I was watching it. I don't know if you've ever been watching a, a TV show or movie and you're like talking to the characters in the show. Like you, you're like, you know, you're, that, that's how I was. And I'm, I'm seeing this and I'm like, I found myself talking to the screen and I was, I was pleading, like somebody do something. It's not, this is not, come on, you can't just stand there. You can't, come on, man, he's crying out, man. He said his mom. And, and I was just, I was in disbelief, partly, you know, because I saw myself. You know, I felt like I was watching myself. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I was challenged by what happened. And then, you know, I, I think about what is said afterwards, right? Because it's the act itself. Um, but it's, you know, afterwards in the report is, you know, the report didn't reflect what happened, right? The police report that was initially released that talked about there being a struggle and then they noticed that he was going into some type of physical distress. And, and that's, I mean, those, the, the initial, you know, suppression of humanity, it challenged me, but then it's the continued injurious commentary that, that challenges what we're supposed to take away from the situation. You know, his, his, you know, George Floyd's daughter was, you know, was on, you know, the shoulders of someone saying, my daddy changed the world, my daddy changed the world, but how different would that have been for her had it not been brought to light, had we just gone off what was said? Had the video not, not been made public, what would that young lady have thought about herself and about her possibilities and about what she meant in this world and, and, and about her dad? Those are the things that challenged me. But I, I am, I'm optimistic in, in that, you know, I, I went to a march, um, you know, there, I, you know, I, I volunteer coach uh, kids in football and lacrosse and some of the kids that I coach were participating in a the march. They invited me up and my wife, Sky, to attend. And when we attended, you know, I'm walking in and it was so amazing to see this, this mosaic of, of, of people, cultural mosaic of people chanting, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, like with passion and with energy and with vigor. And I, it was a stark contrast with the thought of, of dying alone under the pressure of a knee. And uh, so that, that's why I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful that, that we can, you know, move the needle on what we, you know, many of us know has been happening. Um, you know, and, and, and Dr. Rodrigue, um, a, the, a statement that she just made in terms of her concern about bringing a beautiful child into the world because of the trauma that they may face, that I, that I have a huge issue with that, man. We have to be better than that. We can't have people thinking about, you know, not reproducing because of, the world that, that we've contributed to, yeah, we've got work to do. I'm honored. Uh, to be here. Yeah, we've, we've got a lot of work to do. You know, um, just in reference, Orlando, to what you said about um, uh, the first police report and how it didn't reflect what really happened. You know, Will Smith has now famously said, racism isn't getting worse, it's just getting filmed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a really, um, good thing and powerful thing that somebody recorded what actually happened. Um, I want to know more about your stories now, your, your personal stories. Uh, and I'm not even going to ask if, I'm going to ask when. When you were first confronted with racism, uh, what, what happened? And if not you, I'm certain that it's somebody close to you. So I'd love you to share. Um, Jamil, can you go first? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll start with the day I remember first uh, thinking racism was a thing uh, was when I was eight years old. And um, so I come from a biracial family. My mother is white and my father is black. And uh, we were together driving home from a, some kind of Christmas event and the police wound up pulling us over. And uh, I remember noticing the difference initially, immediately in just like how my father and my mother reacted in the situation. My mom was fairly calm. My father was very stressed out. 
the police yelled at him and berated him. And the car accident we were in was very minor, but they treated him like he had, you know, was like a fugitive or something. They made him sit down on the, on the curb, um, you know, and to see um, the man who you look up to as an authority be treated that way, it just, you know, at eight years old, that stuck with me. And I was like, man, like, what did, why, why are the cops treat my father like this? And um, I remember they also walked over to me and I was seated in the back seat with my legs hanging out where the door was. And I vividly remember the flashlight in my eyes and the cap that the officer wore covering his eyes and him yelling at me. And I was just frozen and just scared. And I, I couldn't understand what was going on. And part of how I processed that day was, okay, well, my father as a black man, as a dark skinned black man, this is how he gets treated in our society. And I thought, well, my mother as a light skinned white Canadian woman doesn't get treated that way in our society. And that planted a seed in my mind for thinking that th this is what it means to come of age as a black man. Like I'll know I'm an adult when I start to go through that. And so as I started to grow and I go through middle school and get into high school and I would get that kind of attention but from security guards and police officers, it felt like that was supposed to happen. Like that's, that's normal, like that means I'm growing up. And um, yeah, and it, and it shaped my perception of, of not just police officers, but I think authority figures um, throughout my, my childhood and, and certainly I think was a big part of why I had a very rebellious uh, spirit as a young man and you know got into some got into some trouble so that day really stuck with me and I, I, I find it to be I hope instructive for people to see how you know even within a family you can have such big differences in how we experience the world so if we can't speak to people outside of our family about it imagine how much harder that is right mm -hmm. absolutely Dr. Rodrigue, please weigh in. You can call me Hadia now. We're all we're all friends. <laughs> I'm just trying to punch that doctor. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, go, go ahead, Hadia. Well, I taught myself to read when I was two. Uh, my dad gave me a hooked on phonics book and he came home and I was reading and then he was like, my work is done. <laughs> and I went to school to JK at the age of four. And when I got to school, I had no interest in anything but the, the library corner. I ignored the sandbox, I ignored the blocks, I just went straight to the books every day. And sometimes the kids would gather around me and I would read stories to them. And so that happened, I think, for about a month and my parents got a call from my teacher asking them to come in for a parent-teacher interview. And my dad, of course, thinks that this is obviously about his brilliant, beautiful black daughter and her genius. And so he shows up to uh, this meeting. And the teacher proceeds to tell my father that she thinks that I may be mentally challenged uh, because all I do is sit in the corner, pretend to read books, that I won't play with the blocks, I won't interact with the sandbox, and she goes on and on with these examples. And you know, my dad likes to recount the fake concern that she had in her eyes. And then she finishes. My dad asks her if she's done. And she says, yes. And she says, are you an effing idiot? I'm not gonna swear on, on, you know, on this broadcast. And he says, even if what you say is true, the fact that a four-year-old can tell stories that gets other four-year-olds to sit still is remarkable. And for those of you who have four-year-olds, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then he said, if you paid any iota of attention to my daughter, you would notice that she's not pretending to read. She is reading as she has been doing since she's two. And she doesn't do your bullshit eight-piece puzzles because she does 1,500-piece puzzles at home and she can solve these in her mind. He asked for the principal. Principal sided with the teacher. My father demanded uh, educational testing. He wanted a verbal report after it was done. And so this woman came, a psychologist came, interacted with me, you know, started doing a puzzle. I looked at her like she was an idiot. I said, that looked too easy. Do you want to do this puzzle? I pulled one out from my bag. I read to her from a Toronto Star article. She came storming into the back room, swearing up a storm, just saying, how could you believe that this child is mental is slow. She's probably one of the smartest kids I've ever interacted with. And I actually got my IQ tested later. I was put in the gifted class. I was skipped three grades. Jeez. And you know, my IQ is in the 160s. 
And if I, and I did the math, I would have been one of the top two four-year-olds in Toronto at the time in terms of IQ. If she is categorizing me as slow, what is she doing to the average black kid? Right. How is she treating every other black child who doesn't happen to be a genius, right? And if, if that was her thought about me, likely the smartest kid she ever had in her class, you know, what, what kind of a teacher is this and how, what kids are getting streamed, what kids are getting attention? And so that was my first interaction with racism as a four-year-old. Four-year-old, four-year-old, eight-year-old. This is, this is what we're hearing today. Mike, how about you? First of all, Dr. Rodriguez, can I borrow some gray matter? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you are phenomenal. You are sen sensational. Um, I, um, I, I have to say that um, I, was, I was born the same day, um, or not the same day, I'm sorry, the same year as desegregation happened. And so uh, racial tensions were there from the very beginning. Uh, I want to maybe just go backwards a little bit. When, when I said I hadn't felt racism um, like that since I was a kid, it wasn't because I hadn't experienced racism like that because I was a kid. I had decided that it wasn't going to hurt me anymore. That I, was, I wasn't going to, so, so when it happened, it's, it's what they do, it's just another thing, right? And, and so you kind of built up that wall and, and, and so this broke down that wall. It wasn't that it didn't happen, it, 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 was, it was that this, for whatever reason, and I think it's happened to so many, uh, this, this broke down that wall of defense that I had built up. And uh, uh, so my actual situation is, you know, growing up in Florida is, not ever realizing that racism wasn't real. I, 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 don't have a, I, I don't have a tangible moment that I can remember. Obviously don't have Dr. Rodrigue's memory, um, but I don't have a tangible moment that I remember where racism wasn't alive and well. Wow. Well, that says a lot. That says a lot in itself. Um, Tanya? Mm -hmm. You know, I think back to when I was a student at school too, when I was a young girl and people would always, always, and they always do to this day, they always ask me, where are you from, you know, um, and not in the way that we need to say that to each other, but in a way of, wow, you're so exotic looking, you know, where are you from? Um, and I would tell people that my father was Polish and my mom is Ujibwe. And as a little girl and telling people that people would look at me like I had six heads. And that continued throughout all of my childhood from the time I went to school. And I would talk a little bit about where my mom was from. You know, I thought that every, I thought that every family had grandparents that went to residential school. I thought that that was normal to have your children taken away and to not know your language and to not be proud of who you are because you are an Indian that's how you grow up you know just, there was a time i grew up in the 70s and the 80s the 90s canadians didn't talk about us they didn't want to there is a quiet racism that runs through this country when it comes to indigenous people and it has always been there it is systemic and it's just there all the time you know you see it in newsrooms you see it in schools when you talk about our history and you have one paragraph i never learned the history of my people in my school. I learned from the people I know and from my families. Are we getting better? I don't know. You know, now I hear it all the time too. People are so subtle with their racism. If I had a dollar every time somebody came up to me and said, wow, you're so articulate. I get that all the time. I'm sure everyone on this panel does, right? It's like, what are they expecting? <laughs> it's just it's so insulting and people don't even realize what they're saying and that's the racism of indifference that has killed so many of our people and continues to to this day mm -hmm. so it's it's like it's long running and it's constant and it's always been there yeah absolutely orlando please share you know uh growing up 
some of the things that you, you know, I, I grew up in uh, Toronto community housing and in the area that we were in when we had like camps or when we would talk with some of the guys and the, the young people that were older than us, they would always uh, share with us that people are going to look at you differently outside of here, right? There's some things that, you know, people may not expect of you or they may, may look at you funny. So when I was out and about, and folks would look at me, I, I wasn't really processing anything other than they're just looking at me because I'm from this part of the city and this is how they look at us. It wasn't until, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the movie, The Usual Suspects, where at the end of the movie, you're like, there's dot connecting in terms of things that were happening all along. And uh, when, I, when I began to uh, drive and I would, we would drive, there'd be three of us three young black males driving um, from our place to go play basketball. Um, and we would be pulled over, like I, I'm talking the drive was maybe seven kilometer drive. And uh, we would get pulled over all the time. So much so that we got to the point where we would bet what the reason for them pulling us over was going to be. And whoever won the bet, the other two or three would have to pitch in and buy them a dessert at McDonald's. Right, because we were getting stuff for, you know, there was a break in over here. You fit it. We, f we always fit the description. So as soon as we saw the lights, we're like, all right, what do you think it is? Right. And, and, and we thought that it was funny. We thought it was normal. Right. And it wasn't only until later on we're reflecting on how messed up it is that we, we were taking this, um, what, this experience that we were having and we were like almost like gamifying it. And just, you know, in terms of that's how we were dealing with it in the moment, right? So th there, are, and there are a number of, of folks who experience challenges like that all the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing, Orlando. Tanya, you mentioned, you used the term quiet racism uh, with regards to Canada. And I think, you know, one of the huge topics of discussion has been comparing racism and how it rears its ugly head in the United States to mm -hmm. the reality here in Canada. Um, Jamil, I, I wanna go to you for this question because I know that you consult um, with the provincial government in Ontario uh, and it was the premier who did compare the states to the situation in Canada, in Ontario, and, and basically say, hey, it's much worse over there, isn't it? But in listening to everyone on this panel, and I've got my own stories, I know that not to be the case. Can you speak to that and the whole idea of people who say, well, not here in Canada, we're, we're fine. All of that bad stuff is happening over there and like to point their finger uh, to our friends to the South. Yes, I mean, I, I certainly had a, uh good conversation with the premier about that, what I think is a mistake in doing the comparison between the U.S. and Canada. I think, you know, frankly, regardless of where the U.S. is, even on other issues like healthcare, we don't say, well, our healthcare system is better than theirs. We still expect it to be good. And on, on, on something like racism, I think we need to have the same perspective, which is regardless of what's happening in the U.S., we still have our ideals and we should be working toward those ideals and no one, no other comparison points should take us away from that. Um, you know, I, I think that the, uh, the, the challenge of course is that, you know, the United States dominates so much of our, um, our media, it dominates our, our politics, dominates our culture. And I mean, even the, the fact that the George Floyd murder had this ripple effect on Canadian society is, a, is an example of that. So there's also the, 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 the opportunity created by people understanding what's happening in the US and then being able to say to them, hey, you know what, that also happens here, right? So I think it works both ways. Sometimes it's a disadvantage to our ability to make changes here and sometimes it can work in our favor in terms of shining a bigger light on these issues. But it absolutely is a, is a mistake. And I think it, you know, it, it lets us also gravitate from local problems. Like right now, there's, a, there's a, a, a number of things happening with the Peel District School Board, for example, which I've been working on for months, some of these, the, the reforms that need to be done. And we, re we released a governmental report in February that plainly said, like acknowledged openly that black students are being disadvantaged through the school system. By the way, suspension policies, 
are, are affecting students. And by the way, streaming policies are affecting students. We openly acknowledge that. And I, at the time in February when that came out, and from February up until a couple of weeks ago, have been trying to make as much noise as I could to say to people, this is a really big issue. Like, this is a big problem. We need, like, not just the government, but everybody should be talking about it. But I couldn't break through on that problem the same way we're able to break through on this now. And so my hope is that we, 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 we understand that, you know, we can't let the U.S. news cycle determine how enthusiastic and committed we are about addressing these issues. And when we see things in our local news, when we see things in our local communities, I think we need to make sure we treat that as much of a priority as the things that might be on television or, or trending on Twitter. Jamil, can I say something to that too? Um, I, uh, I appreciate you, you saying that, you know, because when Doug Ford said that, I think a lot of us just kind of went, oh, no. like, is he living in the same place that we're living in? Um, just briefly, you know, um, I come, my mother's family is from Thunder Bay, from Fort William First Nation. And what we've seen in Thunder Bay is so many of our children dying in the water, um, unexplained deaths of, of our kids. And the Thunder Bay Police Force has been um, found guilty of systemic racism um, and essentially has been given in, by Indigenous leaders three years to retool and redo itself in or before we start saying you have to be disbanded. And I know you, you know all that, but you know, I'm thinking of what can be done at home and thinking of what needs to happen throughout our province. You know, I look at Thunder Bay and I look at the fact that our kids still don't have access to clean drinking water and to um, high school education. Um, and also too, one thing that Premier Ford can do kind of right away is make it mandatory to learn indigenous history in high schools. When he came in, he made it actually a choice. Um, if you're a high school student, you don't have to learn the revised curriculum of the true history of this country. And it would be so great to see him reverse that. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, Hadia, I wanna bring you in now um, because we've touched on the whole idea of racism light. Uh, in, in Canada. Um, I've always said, you know, when people show you who they are, believe them. Uh, and it's, it's hard to detect sometimes when it's systemic and when it's insidious. When someone isn't wearing a white cape or burning a cross on your front lawn, you sometimes, you know, question what it is. Why didn't I get that job? Um, why wasn't I considered? what are they really saying about me you wrote an article in the globe and mail uh, that i will never forget um, about being a lawyer on bay street and also why you left um, tell us a little bit about that uh, and and the kind of racism that, I, that i'm talking about that's alive and well in this country i think that people tend to dichotomize racism they think there's either the bad racists or the KKK or the people who use the N-word. And then there's people who are not racists. And they forget that there is a spectrum that on any one day you could do something that is racist. Um, but people really want to fall into these two buckets. And so, you know, my, my particular expertise is the workplace where my PhD uh, is focused on and I you know, worked in a Canadian workplace. And no one's calling me the N word in a boardroom. You know, I'm not getting overt acts of racism, but it's the subtle things. It's the things that kind of add up like drops in a bucket that you're carrying. And eventually the bucket just gets too heavy. So on my first day of work um, at my firm, I was wearing my nicest suit from Holtz. I was carrying a new briefcase. I was very excited. I stepped into the elevator with two women. They looked at me and they asked, who do you work for? So I said, oh, the labor group, labor department. And they're like, no, 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 who's your lawyer? Because the implication was I was an assistant. And not that there's anything wrong with being an assistant, but when you are already the only black woman in a firm of 220, when you already question your own legitimacy, small things like that add up and add up and add up. 
It's the raised eyebrow when someone finds out that you're the lawyer on their file. Um, you know, it's being asked to get the coffee or to take the notes and noticing that the white male associate is never asked to do those things. Um, it's the small things that add up. And it's also even the well-meaning people. So I had another example where um, I was at a meeting and we were asking about the makeup of the organization and the, the person we were interviewing pointed at me and said, well, they're mostly black. And then it became my job to make everybody comfortable with what happened because the white partner I was with froze. And the thing that actually was the most hurtful about that incident wasn't what that person had done, did, but it was when we got back to the car that that lawyer said nothing about what happened. She didn't apologize. She didn't say, I'm sorry, I didn't act. What could I have done? Like, sorry, that happened to you. I was just made to feel like those things didn't matter and that the client and the work was more important than me. And it's, it's the small things that add up. You know, people are afraid of, you know, saying the wrong thing, of someone calling them racist. Well, I'm afraid for my father every time he steps in the car. You know, I, I want to know that there's an actual meritocracy, not that there is a shadow of one. Uh, you know, there are those of us who can't breathe because we've been passed over for a promotion due to the color of our skin, who will never make more than a certain salary, who will be forced out of the workplace, you know, because we can't step up the ladder. Um, who have to suck up to, you know, another incompetent, frankly, racist manager who's been promoted, not because they're actually, you know, able, but because of their connections, you know, that we have to constantly prove that we belong in this corporate culture instead of the culture making space um, for us. And I mean, I, I, to this point, I'm just kind of tired of people talking about it. And I want to see their policies. You know, for example, we've known that black names on resumes get fewer callbacks than white names for 20 years. If your name is Jamal, you will get half the callbacks that Greg does. And in order for Jamal to get the same number of callbacks that Greg does, Jamal needs to have eight more years of experience. Yet point to me to a major company that uses anonymized resumes in their incoming process when they know that this is a problem, when they know that black people are being streamed out. And so I just find it hard to take a lot of companies seriously when the research about what you can do exists and they choose not to act on it. And what I want to see, I don't want to see statements and platitudes about, oh, you know, we at X company really take racism seriously because those aren't true. And you get like tons of comments underneath the actual black experience in those organizations. And so I want to see actual action. What are you going to do? Not that you just feel bad that other people feel bad. Yeah. I mean, power, power doesn't like to relinquish it. Right. But I, I'm wondering whether we feel uh, as a group that we're in a moment right now. And I asked this in a moment that could precipitate change because I, I asked this because my dad um, who emigrated to Canada from Trinidad some 60 something years ago, went to school in Boston at the height of the civil rights movement. And in speaking to him these last couple of days, he really feels that this is similar. It feels the same way. And he feels that the difference right now is that the crowds as you know, Orlando alluded to are more diverse. People are marching together. And that's not something he necessarily saw back in the 60s all the time. So Orlando, I want to bring you in here to ask, you know, do you feel that this is a moment? Are we on the precipice of change here? Um, and is it dangerous to step off the gas pedal right now? I, I definitely feel that we're, you know, on the brink of, of change. I feel, um, as, as you had articulated, um, I, I never anticipated in my lifetime seeing uh, people who weren't black thinking about, uh, reflecting on, uh, introspectively challenging themselves on what it might mean to be black or African American and, and, and how they may have contributed to different scenarios um, of, that have challenged people of color. Uh, so, so given that scenario where we have people saying, oh my gosh, I just, I didn't know, um, I think that in and of itself gives us an opportunity at least to start having some conversations that people feel engaged in and feel like they have opportunity to be a catalyst in, in order to move the needle on what's possible. When I saw, um, you know, when I saw George Floyd murdered, um, 
you know, one of the things that I thought about um, was as I'm, as I'm watching it and, and trying to disconnect myself from what I'm viewing, I, I started to think, well, what if that was a relative of mine? Or what if that was my son? Or what, what if that was someone with whom I had, I had physically interacted with as a coach, as a teacher or something? And, and I'm not talking about George Floyd, I'm talking about the officer. Right, I started thinking that well, you know, that that, that suppression of humanity, the act in of in and of itself isn't where it began. Right, it's thoughts. Our thoughts are things that manifest itself in, in behaviors. Right, and I just started thinking, well, how can we, as as a society, and as individuals within that society, create inflection or reflection points for people to think that's a human being right there. Right, and I'm going to stand for that human being. That's a human being. I see you as a human being. And, and what can we do to move the needle in our workspaces, in our communities, in order to make that you know, more of a, of a reality or a possibility at least? So the question about taking our foot off the gas pedal, I don't think now is the time for that. Um, you know, we journey hard now, we rally together now, we look at how we can affect change in every space that we're in. And, and, and we keep going until, until we, we get there, right? And, and maybe I won't see it, but guess what? Like the reason why I breathe is to serve and to move the needle on these things. So I'm gonna keep going until I can't, right? And, and I'm just encouraging others to be willing to, to do the same. Mike, do you see hope? Do you see hope coming out of this, well, what has been a really dark time? Uh, I, I, I do see hope and, um, in, 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 in saying that, I actually uh, mentioned uh, um, in, an, in an earlier interview that when, when, when we are together, it's a protest as a Black community. But when the greater community joins us, especially the white community, right, it, it transforms from a protest into a movement, right? And so um, one of the things I think at this point is just to be honest, right? And um, to be pro-status quo is to be anti-Black. To be pro-status quo is to be anti-Indigenous, right? At this time, right, if, if you don't see it, um, you are anti-Black. You, you are working against me, right, if, if you are pro-status quo, if you want to... Um, uh, have things to stay the same. And, and so uh, I think moving forward and, and trying to, um, it, it's such a difficult thing. Uh, I heard someone um, make this analogy. They said, um, the CN Tower has been standing there, right? The CN, CN Tower re represents racism. And I've been, I've been driving around, I've been avoiding racism all of my life, right? And it's like um, other people have woken up today and say, hey, you see that CN Tower? I, and, and, and it's like, wow, like I've been navigating this all of my life. The important thing, though, is that they see it, right? Is that they see it now and see it at this point. And um, I, uh, I, I hope, I, I do have a real hope uh, that, that some change will come. A week ago, I was thinking it was going to lose steam. So I haven't, th this is built up. And so I, I, I have more hope uh, today than I did last week, right? That, that things are moving in a direction uh, and that hopefully we will get progress. But progress um, doesn't mean paying attention to this for a little while, right? Uh, Progress means that we have, and this whole idea of equality, right, is, is not the first stop. That, that's just not a reality because you can't legislate love, right? right? What, what we should be looking for, right, is fairness. You know, Hadia talked about some of the statistics and, and statistically we can look and say, okay, this, this is balancing out better. So, so in other words, this, at this point we should be pushing for more fairness. <laughs> Equality is not close, right? We're, that, we're, we're not in shooting range there, right? We, we, we can move towards fairness. And as we move uh, towards fairness, um, someday we could look forward to that, that concept, that ideology of equality.
Can I just say something about hope before we yes. get off of yes, it? Yes, please. Um, one thing I've been particularly hopeful about um, is seeing increasing calls for defunding and even, you know, defunding the police and the abolition of the police. Um, I think this is something that people couldn't even fathom or consider two weeks ago. And now it's getting this galvanizing energy. I mean, we've been defunding education and health for years. So, you know, why is defunding the police um, any different? Right now, what we use law enforcement to do is to manage the fallout from cutbacks in our social services. Um, and that, as we see, if you look at the Toronto police budget, it is breathtakingly expensive and it cheapens human life. And I think that we are having this new increased recognition that abolition doesn't really mean just the closing of prisons, but the presence of the vital systems of support that many communities lack. And I mean, people thought ending slavery is a radical idea once, right? So mm -hmm. just something to consider. We can rethink the way, we can really rethink the way we do things. Um, and I hope that's the thing that comes out of this movement. That's what I'm most hopeful for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too. I was thinking about that, that, you know, there is a call by many uh, about defunding the police, as you say, Hadia, and, you know, just a little while ago, just, you know, uttering the words Black Lives Matter uh, was controversial. So things have changed, you know, rapidly. Uh, Jamil, can you weigh in on that? And, you know, I guess from a political perspective, from a grassroots perspective, um, the police role in all of this and, and how you um, how you see that? Yeah, so, so de defunding the police as a matter of uh, changing police budgets is not something new. Um, of course, that's been something debated at city government levels for a long period of time. Our, uh, our, our soon to be outgoing uh, Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders in 2017 actually produced a report trying to reduce the Toronto police budget by $100 million. Um, and so I would encourage people who are interested in talking about police budgets to look at that report. What's worth noting, however, is that, you know, the reason why his report never became uh, Toronto policy is because in 2018 and 2019, uh, shootings went up. And in 2019 in particular, um, we had the most shootings we've had in an entire year in, in the city of Toronto. So the public then was not interested in defunding the police. They wanted more cops and the police budget was increased at that point. I don't want to make this a Toronto-centric conversation because I know we have people from all over the country on this call, but I just wanted to highlight the, the, the practical challenges that people have faced in the past. And maybe if we think about those challenges in advance this time, then, then a conversation about changing police budgets at municipal levels could go differently. Okay. Um, I can't believe the hour is almost up, but it is. I want to give everybody a final thought, uh, maybe give you a minute to do that. And uh, Tanya Talega, I want to start with you. Um, you said so many interesting things. Uh, I, I know that as far as Indigenous reporters in this country, uh, reporters uh, make up less than 1% of the people in our newsrooms. And so the people that are putting forward the information to the people in this country are not diverse voices by and large. Mm -hmm. um, that point and beyond, um, what, would you, what would you like to say, a final thought to, to everybody tuning into this today? Mm. Indifference harms us. Indifference is just as awful as loud racist shouting at the top of their lungs indifference can kill you know and this is a time we can all grab and unify and work together because when you look at progress throughout society and changes in society they never came because we waited on time they never came because we were silent it was because we pushed forward with progress so we have to do that we have to stay united we need all of us as a majority out there, black and brown and red, everyone and white out there demanding change and saying, we're not gonna handle this anymore. We're not gonna take this anymore. Um, and we need to be making decisions. We need not just to be the journalists in the newsroom. We need to be the editors, the managing editors. We need to be the publishers. We need to make the decisions as to what is covered and how it's covered. And that goes for every single newsroom. You can look at any newsroom across Canada and there are hardly any faces that look like us. Hardly mm -hmm. any. Mm -hmm. That's got to change. 
it's got to change. I've been in news for almost 30 years and I have never had a boss of color ever. Mm -hmm. um, Orlando, want to go to you? Uh, final thoughts? Absolutely. So wherever you are, when I say one voice, I'm going to invite you to say one team, but with a lot of passion, right? When I say one voice with great passion, you say one, one team. One voice? One team. One team. One voice. One team. One team. One team. That's what it takes. I'll be louder. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to take all of us doing everything that we can with what we have in the moments and spaces that we have them. There's an Augustine of, of Hippo quote that I love that says, hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the current situation and the courage to do whatever you can with what you have to change it. So I believe that if we wrap arms around each other, if we link arms, anything is possible. And now is the time. Now is the time. Jamil Giovanni. The, the last thing I just wanna note is that, you know, when we have conversations like this, often you'll hear from panelists who, you know, we have university degrees, we have jobs that have some degree of stability. We're in a comfortable enough position in our lives where we can, you know, take an hour on a weekday afternoon to talk about these issues. But, you know, a lot of the folks that I think are dealing with, with what we're describing in a very acute and devastating manner don't have those luxuries. And I think that being mindful of the class dimensions of these problems is really important. I, I really can't stress enough that although we have an education system that works very well for you know, 70, 80% of the students, there's a large number of kids in this province who are really underserved by, by our school system and are left behind in many cases for the rest of their life because of it. So if I could draw our attention to one conversation I hope continues when CNN stops covering this, this issue is around the education system. And I hope it will be normal in our society to call out how the education system is just systematically disadvantaging a lot of working class kids. Great. Hadia? Um, I'm gonna speak directly to employers right now. Um, that's my wheelhouse. Uh, I wanna remind you that you do not exist in a vacuum. That what is happening in the external world has a direct impact on employees. And it shapes the treatment of employees in your workplace. And I think too often workplaces are silent about racial inequities and their impact, often from this position that the workplace is not the right place to have the discussion. And this silence right now is being interpreted in a number of ways from indifference to acceptance and that is not okay. Race and racism are the heart of many of the systemic and long-standing problems we have in the workplace. And conversations about race and racism need to happen in a comprehensive and authentic way. Fixing issues like this is gonna take hard work over a long period of time. You need to have a cultural shift. And right now what I see a lot of is instead of people doing the hard work, they want quick fixes, they want statements. Because thinking about racism and how it's perpetuated by your leadership in your company daily, because it is happening daily, is uncomfortable and people do not want to constantly be uncomfortable. But this is the time to be uncomfortable. You will grow from your discomfort. I'd also like to recommend that some people read two books by two very uh, amazing Black Canadians, one being Desmond Cole's The Skin We're In, and the second being Robin Maynard's Policing Black Lives. If you do nothing else this week, please get your hand on reading these two books. Desmond's book is at the top of the bestsellers list for uh, Canadian nonfiction. Thank you so much. Mike, we're ending this conversation with you, my friend. Mm, judicial fairness, economic preference, and institutional reconstruction. Good starting point. Uh, numbers, numbers have to pan out. We have to move towards fairness. We have to see it analytically before we can feel it in, 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 in our souls. Uh, so we want to really just, just stress that, that whole concept that um, we really need to see change, not hear about it, not talk about it. We need to see change. Finally, building bridges, not fences. We are not enemies, right? We are a part of community. And so this is not us against you. It has to be a we thing. We have to come together. Uh, those of you who don't know Orlando Bowen's story, right? He was um, beat up by uh, a cop. The, um, the cop planted drugs on him. The cop was eventually after four years or so found that he was actually the one selling drugs 
he was convicted. Um, it, uh, Orlando was exonerated. But the day uh, that the cop was evicted, he said these words when his friends tried to celebrate. Uh, he says, this is not the time for celebration. He said, someone lost their father. After a man beat him up, planted drugs on him, right? He could have gone to jail, right? Um, he, had the, uh, he had the audacity to still see him as a father, as a human being. And so the humanity in this has to remain. If the humanity doesn't remain, uh, then it's, it's all for naught. Thank you so much. I, I can't tell you what an honor it's been um, to be with you all today. I hope um, that people have listened well because you've, all of you have brought honest and raw, vulnerable conversation. I'm gonna hand it back over to Martin and Farah now. Thanks, Marcy. You know, I mean, I found today incredibly moving and I just want to thank you all so much. Um, you know, when we decided to do this event, like I have to admit, we were pretty nervous. And we started Speaker Spotlight 25 years ago. We booked thousands of speakers around the world, but we really, you know, we knew today was important and we had to get it right. And once we um, decided on the speakers we wanted to um, have today, uh, we chose the speakers and you all said yes immediately. And um, once we knew who was gonna be on today's event, we knew that, it would come out right, and it did, and you're all fantastic, so thank you so much. Um, you know, we also feel so lucky that we get to work with you regularly, and we've gotten to know you personally, and um, we just think that we're incredibly lucky, so thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanna say again, thank you, Marcy, Michael, Tanya, Jamil, Hadia, Orlando, not just for being with us for the past hour, but for everything that you do uh, to make our world a better place, to educate us, to inspire us, uh, to be better. Um, you know, we really believe that conversations like this are important and need to take place in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces. So please uh, take what you've learned and heard today, continue the conversation with your family and friends, with your students and your teachers, with your colleagues and your coworkers. We need to ensure that when the protests stop, uh, when, you know, as we said, when CNN moves on to another news cycle, that these issues are not forgotten. And it's up to every single one of us to continue to learn and get better and ensure that we continue this conversation, demand justice and equality so that the changes that need to take place do in fact take place. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Please take care of yourselves, take care of your loved ones, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.